Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Tuesday. It's, look, it's a short week, but it, it seems slow. I I spent a little time this morning listening to the closing arguments in the Ahmed Arbery trial, um, which were actually quite interesting. I, I, I must say that I'm just a little bit nervous, given the fallout from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, uh, what what the reaction to that verdict is going to be. That one seems to be a you know, much more open and shut case, but who knows what juries do? You know, I, I know that that there's sort of the obligatory, you know, we have to, you know, make the obligatory statement that we believe in the jury system or the jury system works. Um, does anybody who's who spent a lot of time around juries <laughs> actually, you know, have that much confidence? Uh, so we we will see. And of course, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, sat down, of course, with Tucker Carlson last night, uh, who is proceeding to uh, make him sort of the the avatar of uh, what self defense, right wing violence. Um, we can talk about that back and forth. Um, but we're going to be talking about a lot of different things today um, with my guest. Who is? Let me introduce him in two different ways. Donald Cohen has a new book out called The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. Okay, you can tell this is not going to be necessarily in my wheelhouse, right? Um, But Donald is the founder and the executive director of In the Public Interest, a policy center on privatization and responsible contracting. He's also, and this is like way more important, don't you think, Donald? Mm-hmm, definitely. It's way more important that you are my cousin. We actually have the same grandparents, well, at least on one side. Mm-hmm. So welcome to the podcast, Donald. Well, thanks for having me, Charlie. Um, and, and, and I should say beloved grandparents. And I also want to say that I've been looking forward to this discussion between you and I for probably 25 or 30 years. So I am very excited to be here. Well, let, let's let's talk about that for a moment, because basically for say, 25, 30 years, I think so. We knew each other as kids and played together as kids when we both lived on the East Coast. And I think it's fair to say that we sort of fell out of contact with one another for about 40 years, mm-hmm. <laughs> something like that. I think that's right. Well, you were in Wisconsin. Right. I was in New York and other places. And then what I recall is, and I, I we sort of lost touch. You know, the last time I remember seeing you yeah. was at your dad's funeral, and yeah. I think that was 1984. We 1985, flew, sister, yeah. Five, we, my sister and I flew to, for the funeral um, from San Diego, where I was living. Um, then, you know, I started doing some work and traveling a little bit in the mid-'90s. I remember going, very clearly going to Wisconsin, saying, hey, do you know my cousin, Charlie Sykes? And, you know, I was visiting progressives and community organizers and labor folks, and they all said, oh, my gosh, Charlie Sykes is the enemy of civilization. Yeah, exactly. That, that, was, so, that, was, that, was, that was on my business card. Yeah, and so, no. you know, I, so I put you in that corner, and I assumed if you even knew what I was doing at all, you probably put me, you know, in the opposite corner, and we, you know, there was no reason so you, to get together. You, so here's the thing. So for, for much of that 40 years, you became, and I was not fully aware of this, you were became this big progressive lefty activist. I mean, kind of kind of a heavyweight. While I was here in Wisconsin being this right-wing figure of loathing for the progressive movement. So that explains why you didn't call me when you came to town. Right. That, that probably does. <laughs> it exactly does. And I'm sure that, you know, again, you, you are more visible because you had the radio mm-hmm. show than I was. But uh, I assume that would have been the same on your side. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, to cut to the chase, I think, you know, since we've reconnected, it has been, you know, pure joy um, in, in many ways and, and it, both, both family wise and intellectually. You know, see, this is the the thing because, well, so like many families, split by well, by geography, but also by by ideology. And then you and I did reconnect. I'm trying to think through all the details of it. Re- reconnected, what in like 2017, 2018? Oh, no, after no, the no, whole it was sixteen. No, it was sixteen. It I remember was, very clearly uh, during you the were, election. I was following you on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, idea. you quit, you quit, you know, you left the show. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a, you know, I, and I had read some things, so I knew that was, there were more than one reason you left the, you know, you left the show. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I figured out how to tweet about you and then we ended up tweeting back and forth and con- reconnected you with my mom and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. And your, and your, and your mom was my father's 
favorite sister. I mean, he only had two sisters, but I mean, he was very, very close to your mom, Bobby. And this was really one of the the great things, you know, in my in my recent life. There've been a lot of frustrating things, uh, but reconnecting and getting you know back to know her, um, going out for her ninetieth birthday party, and then you came out too. We mm-hmm. actually talked about that. You mentioned that she had it coming up, and I and I said I'm gonna co- I'm gonna come out, and then you you made it a big deal. You actually well, I actually well, there was actually no plan to do a party until yeah. you said I'll come to the party, and I called my sister and said you know, don't you think we ought to do a party? And so it was actually your idea. Well, I had no idea. Okay, so this is how weird the world is. People need to understand this, okay? People need to understand how weird the world is. So you and I reconnected. We went back and forth. You live in LA. I live I live in Wisconsin. And I think I have this right. You correct me, okay? Hmm. So I got invited to go out to do the, the Bill Maher show. Correct. And and the producers were really, really nice, said, hey, if you know anybody in L.A. Uh, who might want to come and see and see the show, um, let us know and we'll we'll give them we'll give them tickets. And I said to the woman, I said, no, I, I, I really don't know. I don't know anybody in L.A. And I hung up the phone. And I thought about it and I go, wait, <laughs> Donald, <laughs> cousin. <laughs> my, my cousin, Donald Cohen lives in L.A. And so I, I called her back up and I said, hey, could we, we do this? And to make the long story short, um, you came to a couple of the Bill Maher shows. We kind of reconnected. We had dinner. I got mm-hmm. to meet your wife and some of your friends. And, and that was where the conversation about your mom uh, c- came up. Mm-hmm. And and as a result of this, we've also reconnected with um, other members of the family, in- including another set of cousins that I think you'd also kind of fallen out of. With mm-hmm. a, a little, I don't know. I don't, uh, yeah, not as close. We're not as close, but yeah. 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 So that's and so, I, but I remember yeah. something very specific at that uh, dinner. The first dinner we had, we spent three hours talking family politics, and I said, "So, Charlie, you know, we were t- we were testing each other out because yeah. of where we were coming from politically." And I said, "Charlie, what do you think we agree on?" And he said, ah, "Probably nothing." Yeah. So I made it my mission, and I would text you every once in a while to say, "No, I don't agree with that. There's some things going to we're going to find in the Venn in the Venn diagram that where we overlap." And I've been on a mission for that. And I think we, uh, I can't think of right now, but we have definitely found things where we agree on things. I think we probably both moved. In no, and, I, and I think so. And I also think, you know, I, there was that period, if we had actually, you know, reconnected maybe in the late 1990s or um, the early aughts here in, in, in Wisconsin, or certainly after 2010, things felt, you know, m- much more certain and the lines were more rigid. And for me, you know, as 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 politics has become more polarized, I become less clear about some of this stuff. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like yeah, totally. a, a little bit less. Like, okay, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe yeah. you know, and and that and that actually helps in the discussion because, as opposed to, I would say ninety percent of my conversations a, a decade or two ago would have been a contest. Like, I, we, we're having a discussion because I want to score points and win. And mm-hmm. now it's like, let's have a conversation because we might have a conversation. Yep, that's yeah. exactly right. And I, you know, and I, I, I mean, obviously, there are many places in the world where those conversations don't happen. And it's a point of great frustration and horror to both of us. But I thirst for those. I do too. And and this has been this has been a a a, a blessing. So, so you know, speak, speaking of family, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. People going, hey, you know, with all this family reunion stuff. Um, the other thing that that you and I sort of, uh, you know, began to discover was a little bit about our our family background, including, you know, the the patriarch of the family who came over here, um, a Russian Jew named Harry Potamkin, uh, mm-hmm. who came over and basically had nothing figured out that he'd make some money by selling fish um, in Philadelphia or, and or New York. I think it was New York. Mm-hmm. And and eventually um, became like a big fish guy. And, uh, you know, one of the stories that I, that I thought was awfully interesting was that he wanted to expand this and he made his fortune by figuring out how to refrigerate train cars so that he could bring fish from Wisconsin. And he actually came out here to Wisconsin because this was the source of savory fish that he could sell to Jewish women in uh, Philadelphia and, and in New York. And so he became, you know, kind of well known. And then he married into what was really Russian Jewish royalty. He was just sort of, he was a fish guy, right? I mean, he was, he was just the kind of the, the, the scruffy guy. And he married, uh, he married into the Suzanne family. And I mentioned this because he, he married Rose Suzanne. And for people who are following along at home, 
Um, this is our connection to the the 1960s best-selling novelist uh, Jacqueline <laughs> Suzanne, who was really a member of our family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. So I mean, you know, we, we go back. Yeah. Yeah, well, we could okay. do this for a long time, Charlie. So I know we could do this, we, and, 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 we could, and we could bore we could bore all of our <laughs> all of our listeners. Okay, so I want to get to the the uh, the discussion about privatization um, and uh, why you think the privatization of everything is not a good thing. But I just you know, can we, I usually do this as sort of the the, the, the palate cleanser, uh, the various sound bites, uh, you know, over overnight, you know, and I have to admit to you that I kind of, you know, had this thing in the back of my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the real, you know, fuck you, Chris Christie camp for what you did with Trump. But it's like, you know, I also understand that sometimes you have to make weird alliances and he's, you know, now being much more critical of Trump and moving on from Trump and everything. And I talked about it on the podcast last week and David Priest and I from Lawfare were talking about it. And, and David said, I just don't trust the guy. Because Chris Christie's one of those guys that, you know, 24 hours from now could flip around and he'd be he'd be back in in Trump world. And sure enough, sure enough, Chris Christie goes on Laura Ingram on Fox News last night. And I want you to listen to this where because he's assuring Laura Ingram that he would never, ever, ever not support Donald Trump if he was on the ballot. And I think there's the line in there that, you know, the line of support for Donald Trump starts with me. So listen to this. So what you don't like about Trump is more personality or backward looking stuff. The policies you liked, correct? Look, the policies I supported and, you know, Laura, yeah, that, you you know, did. the line of supporting the line of supporting Donald Trump starts behind me. Um, I was the first elected official in America to endorse him in 2016, prepped him for those debates, prepped him in 2020 for the debates, you know, and, and stood up for him as the chairman of his opioid commission and the chairman of his transition. Did but. We lost, Laura, and we've yeah. got to get back to winning. We see the ramifications. Okay, so he's still playing that card, isn't he, Donald? Mm -hmm. It's a little early in the morning to listen to Chris Christie, I have to say, given being in L.A. Um, you know, he's a, cha he, a chameleon would be a nice thing to say about him. <laughs> You know, I, I, there was part of me that was thinking that, okay, maybe we're going to get a little bit of the, you know, pugnacious, you know, Chris Christie after Trump dumped on him that he, you know, want to punch back. But nah. He's nah, a sick Okay, he's got he's got to go back in there and, and and kiss the ring even when he's trying to distance. Okay, the other um, major uh, development uh, on uh, on on Fox News, um, and this is a kind of a local Wisconsin story, the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Look, I, I, I hope people can keep two ideas in their heads at one time, which is that, you know, you can agree with the jury decision in that in that particular case and still think that the whole thing is outrageous, that it's absolutely obscene and absurd that a 17 year old would go into a situation of urban disorder, um, carrying an AR-15 and end up killing two people and shooting somebody else. But the real obscenity and danger is this glorification of the kid. Um, making him into a hero, making him into this sort of avatar of violence, particularly now. I mean, the, the making him a role model for other people that might think, hey, I'm going to bring um, my weapon to uh, to a protest. And, and if I shoot somebody, um, I will claim self-defense. But there was an interesting little tidbit. And I'm, we've talked about this before, but interesting little tidbit in his back and forth with Tucker Carlson where he's complaining about his uh, his shitty first lawyers. So let me just play this. They said I was safer in jail instead of at home with my family. And then after I'm billed... Your uh, lawyer said that. My lawyer said that. John Pierce and Lynn Wood. 87 days is a long time to be in jail. It, it was... It was very long. I lost a lot of weight in there. I, I, I since then gained it back. I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But 87 days of not being with my family for defending myself and being taken advantage to, being used for a cause by these by John Pierce and Lynn Wood, trying to solicit, not solicit, trying to raise money so they can take it for their own benefit. Okay, so does everybody remember who Lynn Wood was? Mm -hmm. I just Lynn Wood is the batshit crazy conspiracy theorist who was pushing the big election lie. He was one of those initial Trump lawyers who was out there saying, stop the steal. And he now he's out there with us. It's kind of interesting that 
that, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse was, you know, <laughs> sitting there going, OK, my lawyer was raising money off of me while I was sitting in jail. Like, hey, welcome to the grift, buddy, because this is kind of a little bit of a side, a little bit of a sideshow. The way in which, you know, grifters and charlatans like Lynn Wood tried to get into the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Other people have done it, but he just raised lots of money and the kid was screwed. You know, I, I think it's a little bit of a side note. Don't you think, Don? Mm -hmm. I totally absolutely agree. It's a horrifying okay. interview, which in every direction here. <laughs> yeah, in every in every day. OK, so let's talk about your book. Look, as the title of the book suggests, um, you are not a fan of. Um, of privatization. You have uh, long argued that a robust public sector is the foundation of a healthy democracy. And, uh, and, and yet there's been this trend where lots of things, you know, public service and goods can be privatized, roads, bridges, water, libraries, prisons, schools, colleges, even parking meters. Uh, so tell me what's wrong, though, with privatizing some services that the, the case would be that they can be done more efficiently and at lower cost than relying on government bureaucracies. Why do you think that the private sector is less trustworthy than government bureaucracies? Well, there's a lot in that question. So, to, so let me roll it backwards. So first off, I don't think it's less trustworthy. So let, let me tell you what the book is and what the book mm -hmm. is not. And let's peel away some of those issues, peel apart okay. some of those issues. The book is not an anti-business screed. Listen, titles get written in all sorts of process. You know that. Your, your previous, you've written a lot of books. Right. Um, what is key is that in contractual relationships, whether it's, you know, hiring, uh, you know, a janitorial service to clean the school or whether it's a, you know, a multinational corporation taking over parking meters, like you mentioned in Chicago mm -hmm. for 75 years, all of those things are, in, are memorialized in contracts of one kind or another. Um, in those contracts, we often and too often hand over the ability to make decisions, public policy decisions, public decisions, to the private operator. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So, um, and then I'm going to, after that, I'm going to get back to the efficiency argument because that's sure. a different argument. Yeah. Right. So um, just a couple of examples. I, you know, you mentioned Chicago, so I might as well say that. And I'm sure you've been there many times given where you live. Um, Chicago in 2009, Mayor Daley in 2009, uh, you know, city bleeding red ink, desperate, you know, budget, budget situation for every city in America. He, on a Friday, offer, you know, announces a proposal from a consortium of Morgan Stanley, a national parking company, and a, and a sovereign wealth fund from the Middle East. And says, they say, we'll give the city up front of $1.1 billion in exchange for the control of the city's 36,000 parking meters for 75 years. So two things are true there. One is it's an incredibly stupid way to borrow <laughs> money on your future parking meter. Uh, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, who knows if we'll be driving in 75 years. But even if the, it was the only choice because of the desperation, um, they got hosed. They sold a billion dollars too cheap. But that was determined after the, the, final, the decision was made. The city council voted. But here's what's even more important, in my view. Now, for the remaining 60-some-odd years of the contract, if the city wants to eliminate spots for bike lanes, right, or for mm -hmm. a, or, or a dedicated bus lane, or a, or just close off a street for a street mall, but, you know, for urban you know, urban planning reasons or that, they have to buy the spots back at the future mm. at the future value of the spot. So you're sitting and or or even like one spot for a, you know in front of a dry cleaner for drop and run or a, or a weekend for a street fair. So let's say you're an alder person, you know, a city council member in Chicago, and you want to, you know, eliminate cars on a street for whatever reason, and it's going to cost you X million of dollars, you don't even make the proposal. So think about it. There are issues, we, you know, land use, plan, urban planning, affordable housing, transit, climate, uh, you know, environmental issues. All of those decisions are constrained by that contract. Hmm. Okay. Now that, and here's, I'll give you one more example because, you know, this is a COVID related example. So there are dorms, you know, in college dorms across America that are starting to, you know, do public private partnerships and, you know, and basically hand them off to private companies to, to do. 
you know, it might make some sense. It's hard to say. Right. So Wayne State and, and Georgia State, I think, were a couple that did that. And they, in, during COVID, they decided that they would want to reduce the population in the dorms. You didn't want people too close together. You didn't want people right. having roommates. So I'll read you. Then the company sent them a letter. I'll, you know, I won't read more than the letter, yeah. but it says, the university does not have the unilateral right under the agreement to institute a policy that would limit the number of students that can occupy student housing. Hmm. That's a public health decision that the university should be able to make unimpeded by private concerns, by, pri- by, by, a, by a long-term contract. So th- that's what I mean when I say privatization. It's not that we don't contract for things. It's just we make sure we have control over the standards and the ability to make you know have make policy decisions when they, when those come up. Well, talk to me about efficiency because that would be the other argument that mm-hmm. the private sector is going to be able to provide these services more efficiently than the government. It was sort of like so you know if I had to choose, what, what you know who 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 does the job better, FedEx or the DMV? A lot well, of people would well, say, Charlie, hey, wait a second, why don't you choose, wait a second, Charlie, why don't you choose FedEx or the United States Postal Service? <laughs> okay, because I, lo- because, I, because I love talking about the DMV. Okay, that's, 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 that's fine, yeah. Look- so first off, the, the, our DMV out here in California is quite efficient now. You go online, you schedule an appointment, you're in and out in, in, in 20 minutes. So just, you know, those are, those are you know, we use them. I use the, the example of the DMV too, but it's not always accurate. Um, so let's talk about efficiency. So first off, it turns out not to be true in lots and lots of cases. There are contracts that are signed with public, with private companies by public agencies, and you know, oops, didn't uh, um, didn't uh, we didn't anticipate X, didn't anticipate Y. You know, they come back for what's referred to as a change order, and uh, you know, and then it's like, and then they they give them more money. It's like you know, painting your house. You hire someone to paint your house. They get halfway through and said. Oh my gosh, we underestimated how much paint we need. Do you want us to stop or do you yeah. want to pay us more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been there. So efficiency, here's it is. Efficiency is spending less or and doing less to get more. That's mm-hmm. what efficiency is. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is there is money that private companies, you know, have to make for profit for sometimes for big companies, massive executive compensation, maybe some, uh, you know, other business expenses, not illegitimate costs. Um, but every one of those dollars is something that's not being spent on the service. So that's really important, right? Um, so then the question is, is if you're, if you're going to spend less on things, we, we ask folks, what are you going to spend less on? Hmm. Okay. Now, it's only a few choices. Fewer workers, lower pay and less benefits for workers, crappier equipment. There, there may be some that are a new technology or a new, you know, or something new or a new method or something like that. Those we can buy, which we want and engage private sector in. But if, if you know, if you're going to spend less money on fewer workers and have less service available, we should know that before we do the contract. If you're going to reduce wages and benefits, we have an inequality problem in, in, the, in the country. And the more we push down wages and benefits, it may be the right thing to do. Maybe someone was paid too much. Contracting but at the America large each level, year there's, there's two trillion dollars um, in contracts. If we're going to do that at scale, by government, we may be. Um, we may actually mm-hmm. maybe increase that at scale. We may be. We may actually may be increasing inequality, and we shouldn't be doing that. And, and yet, there are. Many, many, many uh, examples of government waste, uh, whether it's in the military, uh, military, you know, the, what was it, the, you know, $100 wrench or something like that. I probably am under, 600, under 600, I think. Yeah, actually. the $600 or the, or the, you know, $1,000 toilet seat or, or anything, or the, the practice in, in, in some public sector mm-hmm. organizations uh, of feather bedding, um, you know, the bloated benefits that, I mean, there's got to be an, a mean there somewhere. And, and you know, one of the big pushes for privatization was, look, it's become just too expensive to pay uh, unionized government workers with massive uh, benefits that they want. So we can actually serve the public better by going an alternative route. Again, you packed a bunch of stuff in there, some things that will be fun to talk about. So sort of massive union wages will sort of, I'll make, a, I'll bookmark that. And, and so, because I spend yeah. time with union public yeah. sector workers, yeah. teachers and others who don't, you know, who have decent pensions, some of them who have, but, and, but you know, decent middle class wages, I, you know, so I think that's worth peeling apart, but I'll yeah. set that aside. Um, so 
the issue isn't government or private. It's like I said earlier. Yeah, it, it, the issue is competence, right? People often say, you know, government should be run like a business. Um, I disagree with that. I think it should be run like a really well-run, managed, efficient, and effective government, right? Mm -hmm. We should use the best management methods and, you know, from business. But there are things that we can't do when we run it like a business. When we run it like a business, we, you know, we, um, you know, we government, you know, public agencies have to give it to everybody, have to provide a service for everybody, not just those who can pay. Right. So I think what's important there is, and I, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying earlier, when you contract for stuff, you are, you know, you're signing a legal agreement. So you better make sure that you know what you're doing as the public sector. And I'll make one other point there. Contracting is actually really hard. So you need a very high skill in the government, that, you know, in a public agency that's contracting to anticipate everything that can go wrong. Cause if it's not on the contract, you're, you're out of luck to, you know, to really make sure that you're looking at the numbers. Well, it's a high level managerial skill to be the contracting party. The second thing is when this is what governments often don't do, they don't, if you're going to contract out, what you ought to do is increase the number of people working for the government, whose job it is to monitor those contracts. Well, that's where a lot of things go wrong. You may be familiar with uh, John DiIulio. Um, sure. You, say, you know, yeah. Yeah. he wrote a book called, you know, Bring Back the Bureaucrats. And he said he looked at the federal government and said, we have so many contracts now, but we didn't staff up our contract monitoring. So we've, you know, we've sort of, we've lost control over things. So it's not an either or. It's a how do you do things well. So let's go through a couple of things, um, including what we agree on. Uh, I, I thought one of the most compelling arguments you make in the book is about private prisons. And uh, I guess I had been somewhat ambivalent about this. Um, I think you make a very, very strong case that the private prison in many ways really captures the heart of your critique. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, of, of I what's do. Wrong? So talk to me about the private prisons. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, you know, starting with the efficiency thing, you know, efficiency means lower pay to, to corrections officers and lower pay means higher turnover. This is facts, you know, higher turnover, you know, more violence, more, you know, more corrections officers bringing in drugs. I mean, it's just, you know, when you're low paid uh, and therefore, more, you know, more dangerous prisons. So that's that. Number two is just, I actually feel on this one, uh, you know, I think it should just not happen at all. No contracting mm -hmm. at this level. It's immoral to make profit off of, off of this. But here's what I think is really significant. If, if you look, you know, there are two major companies, uh, uh, CoreCivic and Geo Group, I think the two largest companies. If you look at their SEC filings, they, every year they have to file a, a ten, what's called a 10K to the, you know, the Securities and Change Commission as a public company. And there's a section of those 10Ks that are called risk factors. And the risk factor, and these are things, they're honest, that could affect their bottom line. They're, they're, they're telling their shareholders and their investors. So, a risk for these companies is reduced crime. <laughs> okay, yeah. is, redu <laughs> is, re is reduced is is legalization of marijuana or you know wherever folks stand on that. It's reduced you know mandatory sentencing. Um, that's so. Again, take it up objectively. It's not that they're evil. It's just that's accurate. The incentive it's not good for them. I, I, I was, I was, I was surprised that you know, we in your research, you found that the two thirds of these these states have bed guarantees. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Beds filled, or the state pays anyway. So that you know, part of this deal is that is that there's an incentive then to keep the number of people incarcerated as high as possible which seems to be a really bad public policy outcome here. That's right. And they're, and listen, and they're big companies. They have lots of money. They spend lots of money in politics. They spend lots of money in lobbying. They're all over the ACA, the American Correctional Association's, you know, annual conferences. So, you know, they use their influence that way. They, you know, they were big players, these companies, in passing all the strong on crime laws, three strikes, you're out. You know, listen, whatever they felt as individuals, it was good business. To make sure to put more heads in beds for them. So one of the things that that I think that that I was pro I probably contributed to in terms of privatization going way back into wow I think this would be I, I was going to say the nineties it's actually more like the seventies when I was at the when I was at the Milwaukee Journal uh, was the is the question of of garbage. <laughs> I know that sounds pretty sexy, <laughs> but um, 
you know, at, at, at one time, um, I think pretty much everywhere you had government sanitation workers. Um, everybody was a government employee. Um, mm-hmm. and, and now a lot of that has been outsourced, has been, been privatized. And I, I guess I wanted to get your, your take on all of that because that seems to be an area where both the cost has gone down and the efficiency has not been affected. Um, is, is that the kind of thing you object to or is, no, or is, no, not, or is, at uh, not at all. No, okay, no, and we, we actually, my org- the organization I run, we did a report. We uh, researchers looked at different contracting policies and con- and sanitation contracts in a bunch of cities around the country, and found this is this is actually very interesting. Here is found good ones that have mm-hmm. good public standards, that had good control, that had good monitoring, and not so good ones. Now I don't remember the details; mm-hmm. it was a number of years ago. But that's why I say when you contract for things, you got to do it right. Yeah. You got to make sure that the wages don't go down too far because you you know you don't want those. You got to make sure that that you know that there's flexibility. That if there's a crisis in the city and all that, and you you know you got to make sure that there's public purpose really embedded in that. I mean, we all there's lots of stories, right, of the sanitation worker who you know go you know drives past the the elderly person's house and says you know takes them extra minute to bring out the truck you know to bring out mm-hmm. the, the can. I mean, you have to remember there's public service here. That this isn't just these aren't all just transactional consumer relationships, and we want to make sure that those al- values and ethics and understanding that you're that people who do that work, public or private, are serving all of us. That's what I mean by good contracting. So let's t- let's talk about uh, the the coronavirus and vaccines. I, I, you know, tr- Trump's response to COVID, uh, you would argue, offers an example of handing over public needs to the private sector. And yet, even Trump critics might say that the handling of the vaccine is a pretty successful story of public-private partnership. Your take on that? Some yes, some no. So let's go back to the very beginning. Like the very beginning is he's saying, and his, you know, Jared is saying, let's we're just going to let the market take care of this. And if you remember correctly, you know, you, ha- you know, m- meaning you having states getting access to PPE and to COVID tests and all that. So then you have states competing against one another, driving up the costs, and there was some profiteering going on there. Okay, so that's because the, listen, so that's first is the market can't do something when it needs to be for everybody. Now, that's, the market is different from private industry, the private, a company. So this is, so that's, his first instinct was put it in the market and let us, you know, compete and battle over it. X, you know, absolutely wrong. It needs to be universal. Everybody needs to be made, you know, to, to deal with. Um, the second thing is, so we then, um, the, the feds gave a grant, you know, federal grants to Moderna and then a pre-order by, pre-order agreement to Pfizer, right? Mm-hmm. Those companies absolutely needed to be the ones that, you know, help design the drug, you know, design the drug, um, and produce the drug and distribute the drug, no question. But there's a few things to understand. Those comp- those patents. I mean, actually, here I, I did. A, I, I read a lot about the Human Genome Project in the 1990s. A bit, massive public investment to sequence the genome. That project created the t- you know incentivized the creation of technology to sequence genes, which is why both RNA and DNA. Um, that's why we found this vaccine. We mm-hmm. were able to get this vaccine so quickly because of the massive public investment in basic science at that time. There was also in, in lots of drugs, including these, there was also lots of public participation, you know, of NIH or, 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 or whoever helping to, de- you know, to, to design the science. The question becomes, and they did it, you know, I, I have my vaccines. I'm, mm-hmm. I am delighted. Um, but here's the question about what it gets to is about patents. Now, Patent is a good idea. If you a company, in, uh, you know, invents something and comes a new idea, you have to give them some protections to recoup their investment. But there are times when that should be able to be uh, ignored, right? And you should make sure that the public has control to, you know, over those things at some level. With you know, in fairness, you have to do it in a fair way, you negotiate it out, so that. And, and, and I'll say this now because I think other countries should. We should have just made those patents free. At, at one point, given them the money. Remember, we paid for them. We gave them all sorts of money, the companies, which was a good thing to do and the right thing to do. But I really believe we should have made those, uh, you know, made that technology available to all to move this faster and more universally, and particularly around the globe. 
So I think there's, it, you know, it, there's it, positives it, and negatives in all these things. That's yeah, my no, point. You know? See, I, I see that argument, um, but I also see the other side, which says that, look, uh, you're not going to have robust private companies like Moderna and Pfizer if they don't have that profit incentive. So w one of the things that's working in there, and, and w what I think you're explaining is kind of the balanced view is that this is not just simply, you know, profit-driven companies who are, you know, making this out of the goodness of their heart or, or for business reasons, but there was a lot of other things involved here. But the argument would be, we're a private company, um, you're asking us basically to save, you know, humanity. Um, we need to have some more protection for intellectual property, and that means keeping the patent. Yeah, well, I agree. So that's you just have to be fair. But there is in the law, I think it's in Baidol, in one of the main laws around patents, the federal government does have the power to abrogate a patent under special circumstances, and we didn't do that. But let me let me challenge something. Let me let peel away one little thing. Yeah, one sure. thing that you said about the profit incentive. I think that's an untested theory to be a, now. Clearly, the prop. You know, there's lots of things in the market that private companies have created that we're all both, you know, happy for and addicted to, you know, our cell phones. And I mean, there's, that's clearly a real thing. But I think there's also a lot of that in the public sector, um, that people are motivated to create things to solve problems. Now, I'll tell you a story which may or may not relate, and you may know it. Do you know who Francis Kelsey was? Uh, no. Okay. So not off the top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> so no. she, she was an FDA uh, oh. scientist in the late 50s and early 60s. She was I, responsible. I, I, I do know this story. Oh, no. Okay. This is about it, thalidomide, right? Exactly. So okay, she, was, right. she was responsible for the NDA, the new drug approval yep. process for thalidomide. Uh, had mm -hmm. her name. Um, she single-handedly, she saw what was going on in Europe with, you know, thalidomide that, you know, babies were born deformed and all that. And she single-handedly stopped co uh, thalidomide from entering the U.S. There were only 10,000 uses in the U.S. She, you know, she was recognized by JFK and some national awards. She was very well-known woman at the time in the early 60s. And she went back to work. She did not go, and it was a different time, but she did not go write a book. She did not go start a biotech company. It wouldn't have been mm -hmm. appropriate at the time. She actually went back to work to do her job. So I think it's worth us understanding that there are people who are motivated by service as well to do good and creative things. Um, there are teachers across the nation in classrooms, doing cool stuff that we should all know about as well. And they're not doing it for the money. But one would also have to acknowledge, though, that one of the reasons why this country leads the world in its innovation and in the creativity in terms of, for example, let's go back to pharmaceuticals, drugs, is because of there is that profit incentive. I mean, I, I, I take your point. Um, I, I guess I'm a little more skeptical of relying upon public service uh, altruism in all cases. Yes, that's a big reality, and we ought to encourage it and celebrate it whenever possible. But the reality is that one of the reasons why this economy has driven yeah. much of the rest of the world is because of the private sector, because of capitalism, because of that profit motive. Yeah, well, I don't disagree with, you with that. Clearly, people are clear. We're all motivated by yeah. money. There's no question about that. That's why this is, conversation is sort of super interesting, right? There's actually two sides. Yeah, there's more than two sides, and they're both true, and they're right. all true. So it's the it's the demonization of the public that I reject. It, and it, and yeah, I'm going to make something clear. I don't say government is good. I say public is important, and then we our job is to make government as good as possible. Because in a democracy, it's kind of all we got. <laughs> right. Well, it's, you know, it's our institution. I mean, it's, it's not all well, we got, but it's our institution and we should make it as good as possible. But there are public things and public purpose. We should be figuring out how to make sure happen. See, I used to cover local governments um, full time, and and I remember hearing the phrase. I won't say daily, but I think probably once a week you'd hear the phrase. Somebody would say, "It's good enough for government work." <laughs> yeah, I remember. You that. know, so I mean, I guess that's part of the the sense that that there's a sort of a different sense of urgency, different incentives that just don't drive it, which again underlies why both Republicans and Democrats have pushed privatization. I mean, your book makes it clear that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was Bill Clinton who, uh, I think you used the word supercharged, supercharged privatization through welfare reform. And he created that national performance review to reimagine government. Uh, so, I mean. Well, well, here's the thing. It's profit. See, here's the thing about profit, right? So, I mean, again, this is so interesting. Um, so when we're talking about contracting, we're not talking about profits in, in the, you know, we're not talking about competing. We're talking about, you know, contracts that become monopolies, 
right? We're talking about providing, right. you know, you get a contract, you provide a service, you extract some of the money for the business expenses, and you provide the service cheaper, better, faster, in terms of what they say, which is a little different. So the incentive, if you're talking about, you know, put it into the contracting realm, which, you know, the profit incentive is to get contracts. The, the profit incentive is to put heads and beds in prisons. The profit incentive is to, you know, prevent dorms from being closed, you know, uh, during COVID. So the profit incentive, unfortunately, when it comes to public things sometimes, is, is exactly the wrong thing. So let's talk about something like, and I'm trying just to clarify where you're drawing the line, because it, it's it's pretty clear that you're mainly concerned of the outsourcing of decision-making basically taking up the public sector and turning it into, into, into pr the private sector, but you're not against contracting with private industry, right? I mean, not so it's all. okay to hire contractors to build roads, obviously, right? Um, you know, you know, you know, government can learn from techniques from private industry. So talk to me about, for example, like food stamps. What is, is, aren't food stamps basically completely privatized because you use them in private companies? We don't have government stores, Right. So it's the private yeah. sector that generates this massive cornucopia of food in this country. That's privatized, right? Yeah, absolutely. So food is a private commodity. Health is not. Health is a public good, right? I mean, it's a, it's a public purpose. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you go to food, what's our role? Our role is to make sure it's safe, mm -hmm. it's healthy, it's produced, uh, in a way that doesn't have, you know, that doesn't create food poisoning and food illnesses. That's our role there. Not that there's nothing in the market. Now, we, you know, I mean, should we give out uh, food stamps for people to buy televisions? No, that's not an essential. That doesn't, you know, that's not something we all absolutely need to survive. Should we give out food stamps to be able to make sure to deal with, you know, people who are, you know, people in poverty who who need to eat? Absolutely. So that's not the you know that's not the issue. I mean, let me as you're trying to looking for the balance. I'll go back to the Chicago Chicago parking meters just popped into my head. It's I, I've not been to Chicago in a while, obviously, but not nobody's traveling, so I don't know if the parking meters you know now use take credit cards or not. You know, so sometimes when when folks want to privatize parking meters, they'll say we want to modernize them. And you know, when I live in LA, we use the car. You know, it's fantastic that there you can now use a credit card <laughs> for yeah um, for that now. It may be that that's one of the things they needed to do. Well, you can hire a company to do that, but why give it to them for 75 years? There's part of the balance. Right. So why do you say that health is a public good, but food is not? Um, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because one is- Because I could make the same argument, right? I mean, we could make the same argument why. I mean, there's, there's, there's no life. There's no public health without food. Right. Well, that's that's a good one. <laughs> so, I, like I said, you... I've been waiting for this conversation for thirty years for that question alone, Charlie, <laughs> to be uh, challenged. So, first off, uh, what's right. the difference? Um, there is because first off, we don't want you know it doesn't make sense for the government to be the producer of food, right? But it does make sense. I mean, there's food. There's a, there's thir what we were three hundred fifty million people now. There's lots of food. You know, it's it doesn't make sense for that kind of institution to run that. But should it government does make run sense hospitals and doctors' offices? Then yeah, that's true. But not all of them. Okay. What does make sense? So let's take those apart. So what does make sense is to make it is in our interest for everyone to be fed. Let's just yes. start with that idea. Okay. It, you know, because why? Poverty doesn't just hurt the poor person. Poverty hurts us all at some level, right? It hurts the economy. It's not good for people. You know, you can kind of go down the list of why yeah. we, it's in our interest, personal interest and societal interest for everyone to be, uh, to not, you know, to do, to be healthy. The same thing, so taking it to hospitals and, you know, and medical, it's in our interest for everyone to be healthy. COVID, you know, if that didn't punctuate that point, I don't know what else did. That is what I say is, it became clear that the health of all of us depends on the health of each of us, right? Well, and there's just so, basic human compassion as well. Well, yeah, that too. Yeah, um, <laughs> there is. There is. There's a reason I, why we don't want children starving and people dying. You know? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing. So in, in healthcare, uh, you know, we maybe have different view on this. Is I believe we ought to have some form of universal health care in this country. It's nuts. And, and, and immoral at some level that some people get health care because they can afford it more than others. There should be no difference at a, from a moral perspective, certainly. And, there's, and there are ways to do it. 
and nothing's easy, nothing, you know, but there are ways, but that someone who is poor or sick or what have you should get less health care, less quality health care than anyone else in this country. There's no moral reason for that. No, and 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 also there's there, there's significant downsides to it as we discovered just in terms of the economics of it and the way that that our sort of hybrid system has uh, you know become so incredibly inefficient and at least in terms of cost. Now, in terms of quality, if you can afford it, we do have the quality, and I think that's the fear. Of course, is that yeah, is that the, right. tra- the, tr- the trade off of access with with quality uh, is one that a lot of Americans are not willing to do. So. Yeah, and what then is, I think you yeah. know the issue of rationing there because I started right. right. So that's the, the big if fear. You don't, when you don't have universal coverage where everyone's not in, rationing becomes exclusion, right? We you know you don't get right once you get everybody in, the the limits of cost become uh, you know you're rationing in different ways. You're trying to figure out what everybody can get, what everybody can't get. But until then, it's keeping some people out. And you know you and I now are are Medicare recipients. <laughs> that, 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 that is that is literally true. So I, I, I think part of my you you would like people I think to become more interested and fonder of government, as one of your um, as one of your reviewers said. My skepticism uh, about government also applies to other institutions. I, I fear the concentration of too much power anywhere. I, I am I'm, I'm I am fearful. Of too much power being concentrated in, uh, you know, in private corporations, uh, in unions, in government. I'm, I just, I worry about all of that, uh, and, I, and I think that's that's always been one of the reasons why I've been skeptical of, you know, government, government as the answer to all of our problems. Well, first off, this is one for the Venn overlap. I completely agree. I think the concentration of power, the concentration of wealth, which is related to that, the concentration of influence, I, I, I think is one of our greatest problems. Yeah, I do. I don't I think, think so. there's an, I don't think that, you know, you know, American society and American government is the most complex institution in human, you know, organization and organizations in, yeah. human, in civilized history. Right. So it's never going to be easy. So it, you know, in a democracy, I don't believe government period. It's all good. Government's got to be good where I believe in, in, if there are corrupt officials, we got to get rid of them. We have to pass rules and, and have policies that protect that. You know, I believed, I believed in the balance of power, you know, in, you know, in checks and balances, you know, at the federal level, I'm, you know, everything is kilter now. Yes. But I completely agree. That's why you need balance. That's why you right. need to do it well. That's why you need good contracting. That's why you need good protections against corruption and, and, and government overuse and, and overspending. And, and I think that's also why you need to have a an actual functioning political system where you have the push and pull of these various issues. That that's if correct. you concentrate on you know all on one You'll have the people saying we need to starve government uh, and we need to privatize everything versus people who think, you know, no, the private sector is is the source. And again, this is why you have the push and the pull backwards, you know, back back and forth, which is imperfect. But uh, it, it, the the alternative is much worse. Donald, thank you so much. The book is The Privatization of Everything. It is out today. Correct. Yep, this is it. That's correct. The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. It is a great launching point for a fundamental argument about the the, the relationship between the private and the public sectors. And I am delighted that my own cousin wrote this book. So thanks for coming on the podcast today. Uh, thanks so much, Charlie. It's great to talk to you. And thank you all for listening to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow. and We'll do this all over again.